Good afternoon and welcome to the July 15th COVID-19 update from the government of Yukon. Premier Sandy Silver will provide today's update. We're also joined by Mary Thiessen, our American Sign Language interpreter, as well as André Boursier, who is with us from the French Language Services Directorate. He will translate questions from French-speaking journalists uh, on the line. Uh, following the Premier's update, we will go to the phone line and ask each reporter uh, to ask a question and follow up. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Premier Silver. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, hello again, and uh, thank you for joining us here on the traditional territory of the Kuala Dun First Nation and the Ta'an Kwachin Council. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we now uh, have provided 42 updates for Yukoners in the last few months on our government's response to COVID-19. I appreciate everyone who has turned, uh, tuned in uh, and to stay informed as the situation continues. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, I want to thank the, the media outlets as well uh, that continue to report on these updates and share the information, this extremely important information to Yukoners. Thank you very much. Uh, though in some ways this situation feels routine, it, uh, it is important to remember that we are not in normal times right now. Uh, we're still very much in the midst of the pandemic. The situation has definitely changed over the past several weeks, uh, but the issues, uh, they have not gone away. Um, we are now two weeks into the second phase of our Path Forward plan. We have uh, removed the two-week isolation, self-isolation requirements for British Columbia, for Northwest Territories and Nunavut residents, uh, and for Yukoners returning from those regions. We have also opened our borders uh, to travelers from other regions of Canada. Uh, though they still are required to self-isolate for 14 days when they arrive. Uh, with increased exposure to individuals from outside Yukon, there is a greater opportunity and a greater uh, opportunity for exposure uh, to COVID-19. Uh, today, the Chief Medical Officer of Health announced uh, expanded criteria for COVID-19 testing, uh, expanding the list of symptoms to uh, enable broader testing. That will help with early detection and with uh, contract tracing. We have also reopened the Resp uh, Respiratory Assessment Centre so that we are prepared uh, if there is an increase in the demand for testing. Uh, people will still need a referral, either from 811, uh, Yukon Healthline, a family physician, um, community health nurse, or the uh, Whitehorse General Hospital. Uh, since lifting the border restrictions on July 1st, we have seen 1,587 travelers from British Columbia. We have also seen just over 1,100 Yukoners returning, returning home. As for people transitioning through, we have seen just over 1,600 individuals pass through Yukon. I will remind people that uh, if you have concerns about travelers not re following the designated routes or staying overnight for the 24-hour period, please contact the complaint line, uh, either by phone or by email. All that information is available on yukon.ca. Uh, to date, we have received 119 complaints and have issued four fines. Our enforcement team is working very hard to inform people of the rules that they uh, that they need to follow. Um, there are 45 people working on the enforcement team, and we very, very much appreciate their efforts. There are also many people who have uh, 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 out of Yukon plates uh, that are authorized to be in our communities. We are working on an approach to identify these folks to ease people's concerns. We are now well into summer, uh, as you are all out enjoying the outdoors and your favorite recreational spots. Please remember to uh, practice the safe six, continue practicing the safe six, um, including social distancing, physical distancing. We are also happy to say that public libraries are reopening across the territory over the last few weeks. The, public, the Whitehorse Public Library will uh, reopen its doors to the public on July 21st. I know this uh, community resource has been missed by many, and it is a welcome return. Uh, people will once again be able to browse the catalog, use the computer, uh, printing, and uh, the reference desk services. As it is elsewhere and, every and everywhere, uh, hand sanitizing and physical distancing will be extremely important as people return to the library. 
So far, we have done uh, well, uh, in, uh, and we are continuing to take precautions to follow the safe six. We remain on track uh, to move to phase three because of the efforts of Yukoners. As Dr. Handley uh, said last week, we believe that we will be able to move uh, to the next phase on August the 1st. That will be phase three. And I anticipate having more information about what the start of the phase of phase three looks like uh, very soon. Our progress to date has been uh, possible because of the precautions, as I mentioned before, that Yukoners are taking. We cannot let our guard down now. Each of us is individually responsible for our own safety, for the safety of our families, our elders, and the community at large. We need to keep this up, especially as we're looking to ease more restrictions. Be vigilant about your hygiene, washing your hands and sanitizing your hands and surfaces, uh, staying home if you're sick, covering your face when you cough or sneeze. Follow the, the correct self-isolating guidelines as required. Limit the number of people in social gatherings to 50 people outside and 10 people inside. Travel respectfully uh, to the communities. You can now check what uh, communities are asking uh, visitors on the, Yukon of Count, uh, sorry, on the Council of Yukon First Nations website, which is cyfn.ca. I want to thank Mathea Alatini for, for that and all the work uh, of the folks over at CYFN. Uh, and perhaps the most difficult but very important, keep practicing proper physical distancing. I know this sounds like a reiteration, but it's extremely important to us, for us to reiterate this uh, as we come to these press conferences. These, these precautions are far and away the most important safety measures that we can take. Uh, you all have the power to keep us safe and to keep yourself safe. If, as a community, we can all continue to stay vigilant and we can protect ourselves from the broad spread of COVID-19. Now, as I mentioned, the pandemic is not over. Uh, we still have a long way to go and there are some important milestones yet to come. We know that there are Yukoners who continue to feel the negative impacts of this global pandemic. Our government has extended the rent assistance program for Yukoners who have been impacted by COVID-19. The business relief program is also still available and so far has distributed over $4 million to 429 businesses in the Yukon. The sick leave program launched by Yukon has spurred a national conversation about sick leave and that program is still available for Yukoners who need it. The temporary support for canceled events distributed $1.4 million to Yukon businesses impacted. And while the pandemic is not over, we are already taking some important lessons from this situation. We have seen a resurgence in supporting our local economy. This is key to the economic success, to our economic success, and it is, it is more important than ever to support our local businesses, service providers, and entrepreneurs. They are the backbone of our economy. They're a huge supporter in our communities, and they are key employers in the Yukon. We want to uh, see Yukoners working, and being able to support their families, most importantly. We recognize that affordable early learning, childcare is essential to supporting families and to ensure that we have a strong economy. This is not a new revelation, but it has been brought to the forefront by the economic situation COVID-19 has caused. I'm very happy to announce today that our government has begun working on a universal affordable early learning program here in Yukon. Now the details are still to come, but I have spoken with Minister Frost about this and the work is underway on a sliding scale model similar to what Quebec offers. Affordable early learning and child care is recommended from the recently released Independent Health Review, uh, the report putting people first. And I know Minister Frost is preparing to make a much bigger announcement about this report very soon. Affordable child care is also part of our economic recovery plan for the territory. Our entire team is supportive of this project and I look forward to sharing more details uh, about it in the near future. I anticipate our government will continue to take the lessons learned from this pandemic and use them to make improvements to the lives of Yukoners. While it is often difficult to consider uh, something positive coming out of a situation such as this, it's also important to see the opportunities as they present themselves. 
As we move toward our new normal, uh, we have the opportunity to consider what that new normal should be. One thing that has remained consistent throughout these past months is the incredible resilience of you, Connors. Uh, you continue to impress and amaze me uh, with your ability to adapt and to change to the re realities of, of the day and your desire to support your community, again, is, is amazing. Uh, let's keep the energy going, uh, following the safe six precautions. If we all follow these steps, we can greatly reduce our own risk and the risks for others. And keep checking in on those that are around you. Uh, we are still in the midst of a very difficult time. Uh, offer to help your neighbors or your family members, reach out to your loved ones, and as always, be kind to one another. Uh, we are all in this together, and uh, together is how we're going to get through this. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, the opportunity for uh, some comments, and I will now pass it off to Matthew uh, for some questions from media. Thank you, Premier Silver. Uh, we'll now go uh, to our reporters, uh, starting with John Kennedy with CKRW. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, as the, I guess, school plans get underway and students are made aware of the different plans, uh, you know, for their different schools. Uh, what kind of consultations were uh, were taken to uh, for the MAD program being moved out of the Wood Street School to the Porter Creek Secondary uh, School location? Yeah, so I know the Minister of Education has been uh, on some media uh, dealing, uh, responding to these questions. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just be able to say that, you know, we're, we're not facing a normal school year here. Uh, our government needs to determine how to get students uh, in the classroom with educators uh, and uh, for as much time as possible. You know, that's our main goal here and, uh, and to meet the health and the safety uh, guidance uh, for the schools and to support safe spaces. Um, you know, some school programming needs to be temporarily relocated uh, in the upcoming year uh, because of this, these challenges. Uh, it's, it, it's extremely important to note as well, uh, the department is making alternative arrangements to accommodate uh, those students that are in grade 10, 11 and 12 uh, who need additional support. And again, this is a conversation that the department has been having uh, to make sure that they can uh, meet students where they are and provide uh, them with the programs and services that they need in these very challenging times. We, we have a, uh, a reality, and, uh, and one aspect of that reality is, uh, is that when the, uh, you know, we, we have to, uh, in, with a, a smaller footprint for the FH Collins build, um, you know, it's, it's too small to meet the needs of that school community uh, in this current situation. And as a result, we, uh, we have to make adjustments to accommodate for the numbers of students that are enrolled. Um, with the MAD program specifically, again, this is not a, uh, an ordinary situation, uh, and this will not be an ordinary school year. Um, you know, the, the move uh, is, is definitely not without uh, some criticisms and some tensions. Uh, I will say that Porter Creek has an established drama program, uh, and we believe uh, that the school will welcome the MAD uh, program with open arms. And I'm looking forward to what the MAD students uh, will create this year. And I anticipate, as every year, it'll be better than the previous year. Uh, you know, to meet those health and safety guidelines for the school uh, and to support them for those safe, safe places, we, uh, we, uh, we, we want to make sure that we have a, a safe place for the MAD students. We are very pleased uh, with, the, with the expansion of, exper of experiential programming on a year-to-year -year basis, and, uh, and that will always be uh, present in mind with our government. Uh, we believe that music, art, and drama is extremely important to the development of, uh, of, of young, young students. Um, I myself, being a musician, uh, I, I completely agree with that. Um, and uh, we will make sure that as planning is underway and the moving of the equipment and the supplies to the new location, uh, that these valuable programs can and will continue and thrive. Thank you. Uh, John, do you have a follow-up question? Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask about uh, border control measures uh, in phase three. Uh, I'm not certain if the details are going to be made available at some point in the next week, but are we going to be seeing, I guess, access to the territory from jurisdictions outside of the territories in BC without self-isolation once we enter the third uh, phase? Uh, great question. Um, again, 
our uh, moves forward will have uh, less to do with geography and more to do with epide epidemiology. Uh, again, with BC, we saw a jurisdiction that planked the curve. Uh, we, uh, we're, we've been monitoring Alberta and other jurisdictions as well, uh, and we will continue down that path based upon the epidemiology of those areas. Uh, and if they, uh, if they meet the requirements and after a conversation with the uh, public health authorities, uh, you know, we hope to be very soon in a situation where we can, uh, you know, release Relax some of the uh, the measures, but again, our our ultimate goal here is to make sure that Yukoners are safe. Um, since our opening of the BC border and the change of our uh, requirements uh, for the rest of Canada, uh, it has been a couple of weeks now. Uh, you know, thank goodness we haven't seen any new cases. Uh, we've been keeping up the monitoring of the testing. Uh, we've seen lots of uh, lots of traffic uh, moving back and forth. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to properly self-isolating, when it comes to the, the, the measures that are in place right now, uh, we're comfortable where we are. Uh, we will have a little bit more information for you on, uh, on, uh, on phase three uh, in the coming week for sure. Thank you. We'll now go to Doug Tremblay with Shona FM. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, my question is about the use of face masks. It's uh, been very sort of on and off. People have discredited the use of it, and now people, like various jurisdictions, are mandating the use of face masks. Has that been considered here in Yukon? Thanks, Doug. Uh, great question. I, I take a look at, you know, in the states where, um, you know, they're, they're now rolling back uh, and, and uh, going back to, to, uh, to measures, uh, reinforcing measures again, and in their context, you know, you hear a lot of conversations about, about face masks. Um, we will follow the recommendations of the public health authorities. Uh, what I've heard from Dr. Hanley in the past, uh, you know, again, uh, wearing a, a, a face mask uh, definitely helps to protect others from you if you're in a situation where you cannot uh, adhere to the uh, safe six guidelines of, uh, of staying, uh, staying within uh, a caribou length of other individuals um, as a precautionary tool. I believe it makes sense. Um, you know, I have a mask, and if I find myself in a situation where uh, I can't maintain social distancing, then I would wear it. Um, but again, uh, the government, as far as policy, would be based upon uh, the public health authorities and whether or not they believe that we should, in one sector or another, or in businesses, or in uh, visiting uh, elders, whatever the situation, we'll take the lead from uh, from Dr. Hanley and his team as he uh, consults with uh, public health authorities right across the nation. Thanks, okay. Doug. Do you have a follow-up? No, I don't. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. We'll now go to Stephanie uh, Waddell with the Yukon News. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask about the uh, child care um, universal early learning program you mentioned. Um, I'm wondering what sort of timelines you're envisioning for it to begin, what year it might start. Uh, thanks for the question. Again, you know, there'll be more details to follow. Um, you know, as you uh, have obviously read through the, uh, the, the review, the independent review, uh, this is one of the recommendations. Uh, what we see with the Department of Health and Social Services and with uh, Minister Frost and her team uh, is uh, four years of, of working on elderly care, working at uh, uh, aging in place, working on the Whitehorse Emergency Shelter, and working on the priorities uh, that uh, Yukoners have uh, have have uh, have led us to 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 move forward on, and in that uh, consideration of early uh, learning, childcare was always uh, in the mix. As we look at the considerations and concerns of COVID and what it means to uh, to young families, what it means to single moms, what it means about the uh, um, you know different effects on on women compared to men as far as economical uh, effects, and uh, this this became extremely important as we uh, as we unravel uh, unroll sorry the uh, our approach to the um, to the review, and so. The program is uh, is is exploring offering uh, affordable rates uh, to families uh, on an income based sliding scale, uh, which is extremely important to this government. Uh, and right now, as I said before, we are looking at the Quebec model uh, as an example. Uh, but again, more details to come. But we uh, we're making this announcement now because it is a priority. Thanks, Stephanie. Do you have a follow up? Um, yeah, wondering about the respiratory sector. Um, have there been uh, any any numbers from that uh, since it's reopened? 
Uh, I don't have any numbers uh, for that right now. I can get those for you, um, and those would be numbers coming from the chief medical officer uh, and health, and uh, I don't have any preliminary numbers right now, but I'm glad to see it open up. I'm glad to see uh, expanded testing for uh, for folks with um, with um, m regular flu-like symptoms, those types of things. Again, all of these uh, issues, all of these uh, programs and services and, and moves forward uh, are, are under our number one priority, which is the health and safety of Yukoners. Uh, it's, it's great to have a medical team and a public health team uh, and, uh, and a Department of Health and Social Services that is so nimble to be able to move very quickly to make sure that we are providing the services that we need. Um, right now, it, with the Respiratory Center, it's more... Um, uh, you know, we're, we're preparing for the worst, hoping for the best, uh, and, uh, and it's really good to see the center back open. And, uh, but I will endeavor to get some of those numbers back to you uh, from the, the, the last few days. Thanks. We'll now go to Dave Croft with CBC. Hi, I was wondering if you could expand a bit on uh, what, what you might do. If, what, uh, for people that would have plates, they're allowed to be in UConn, but they have plates that are in UConn plates. I guess, like, how could that work, maybe work? And, I mean, are you actually hearing from people in that situation that they're being harassed in any way or, or anything like that? I guess, you know, basically, what's the reason for for uh, moving, trying to find some system to so they can basically be identified as Yukoners or yeah. allowed in the Yukon? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, I, I It's not so much that we hear from travelers or from folks without out of license plates that are being hassled. It, it, it's more about, uh, you know, there's a big strain on the system. I, I use the anecdotal information uh, on, uh, you know, on a Dawson case where uh, a lot of the calls that were coming from Dawson was one set of plates uh, from, from, a, from the states, but it was a, an individual born and raised Yukoner, you know, third generation Yukoner. Uh, and, you know, that particular individual went to social media and very politely said, hey, folks, it's just me, uh, you know. <laughs> A Dawsonite, um, but I think it really comes down to um, it would be it'd be so much easier for the system for the folks that are on the phone lines, uh, those types of things. If we had a visual uh, that helped people to identify that a car uh, can be where it is, and you know, I, I use the example as well. I'm sorry to keep on harping on on the amazing community of Dawson, but uh, you know, trying to coach in with their um, uh, checkpoints, uh, they had a great system there where uh, if you went through the checkpoints uh, into their community, uh, young uh, Sam Taylor was at the at the front checks and would give you a uh, a check mark and say you're good to go and so that check mark on your dash allowed people to know that this vehicle is safe and that this vehicle was checked in on i think that a system a system like that makes a lot of sense um and uh i think we we just need to be very careful uh about how we do this uh and identify the strains on the system uh and try to alleviate some of the uh the calls that might not be for vehicles uh that that uh, don't need it uh, vehicles that actually are in the right place but they might have a, an out of out of uh, state uh, or out of province um uh, license plate. There's lots of Yukoners, as people know, uh, that have license plates from other jurisdictions. Uh, so we just want to make sure that uh, we always are monitoring our enforcement. We're always monitoring our ability to check in and that uh, that we do that as smoothly as possible with the least amount of confusion. Thanks, Dave. Do you have a follow-up? Uh, I guess I don't know what <laughs> early childhood learning programs are all about. Just, just a short description of what generally what they do. Well, again, you know, this is an opportunity for us to uh, expand our opportunities for uh, for learning. Uh, whether you know, we campaigned on uh, on a model of uh, of learning, lifelong learning, and that's uh, from from early childhood all the way through into uh, into adulthood. And uh, this is one of those components. Uh, we've been working on some pilot projects in uh, in jurisdictions like Dawson again uh, and uh, and Watson Lake uh, pro pro pilot projects on daycares. Uh, you know, people have a, a miss understanding sometimes about what a daycare is, you know, and a daycare is an educational opportunity. It's, uh, it's more than just babysitting. This is a fundamental time in, in, a, in a young individual's life. And, uh, you know, you, I could direct you to so many different studies that tells you the investments you make up front in those early formidable years of a child's uh, development are, are cost savings down the road in high school and beyond. Uh, and so, again, this is an extremely important uh, opportunity for us to work uh, with those uh, 
uh, nonprofit and for-profit organizations, uh, you know, to work with education, to work with health, uh, and to come forward with a model. And again, we're looking at the Quebec model because it's, uh, you know, it's well-renowned right through Canada, uh, offering a sliding scale for people that uh, don't have as much money for, for these types of services. And we're really excited about the details. I I'd like to share more with you right now, uh, but I will leave that to uh, Minister Frost and her team in Health and Social Services because they have done the lion's share of the work on this and uh, they're extremely proud of the work that they're doing and I, I, uh, I, I just want to make sure that folks know that, that we're, we're heading in this direction. This is an extremely important piece of the independent panel uh, review on health and uh, we believe that this is extremely important uh, in best of times uh, now that we're in a pandemic. Uh, for me and the team, it's just another good reason with the statistics that we have seen about how um, uh, the effects of COVID and the financial effects of COVID really are hitting uh, uh, women more than men uh, is, is another stat that really uh, perpetuated this part of the plan forward uh, and we are going to move forward on this because it's extremely important to you Garners. Thanks. We'll next go to Gabrielle Planca with the White Horse Star. Hi. With phase three considered to be the new normal or the last phase before we enter a, a post-vaccine world, does that mean that the adjustments made in August are intended to be somewhat permanent until a vaccine is available in a year or so? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, wouldn't that be great? It, it would be one of those situations, again, uh, as we transfer between phase one, phase zero to phase one to phase two to phase three, there are six triggers that will uh, move us forward and six triggers that would move us backwards. Uh, so it would be very similar uh, in when we uh, transitioned to this current phase. Uh, we had to look to see uh, if uh, clusters of cases were happening in, happening in British Columbia or other jurisdictions or here in Yukon. have to make sure that our testing fac facilities and abilities are, are ramping up. Um, you know, uh, our ability to to monitor folks. Um, you know, one of the biggest worries is a, a cluster or a spread in one of our rural communities. Uh, so making sure that we have the ability to communicate with the First Nations chiefs and councils, the mayors and, chief and, and councillors, um, you know, those are the, the triggers that would move us forward and, or keep us into a phase. Um, and, and so far, so good. Um, you know, with all of the things that we can do through SEMA, with all the things that we can do, partnering with the First Nations and municipal governments uh, to communicate and to keep people safe. Uh, again, the most important answer to your question is, uh, is, is how well Yukoners continue to do what they've been doing. Um, it's hard. It's hard when you see other jurisdictions and the states and, and other places uh, where it just seems like COVID uh, doesn't doesn't change people's behaviors, and here we are in a jurisdiction, and we're we're doing everything we can, and Yukoners are doing it really right. Most Yukoners that I see are are really vigilant when it comes to uh, the safe six, and I, I just I can't I can't thank them enough for that. Uh, we need to keep on going, you know, until there's a vaccine. This is our new normal for now, and uh, our hope is when we get to stage three uh, that we've done it with enough time to check the epidemiology. We've done it with enough time to make sure that we don't move backwards. Uh, what's happening in California? California is devastating right now for the businesses of California. All that preparation to get ready and to move forward, and then you have to move backwards again. I just I don't want to get in that situation. Uh, we are very con cognizant as well that uh, you know being cooped up and uh, and not being able to. Uh, uh, to enjoy what we normally enjoy, uh, like a hug from from friends and neighbors, uh, that's that that wears on people's mental health. Uh, you know, we, we're very aware of the statistics nationally on domestic violence. Um, you know, so finding that balance uh, is difficult, but it's only made easier if we continue to follow science and we continue to file file. To, to follow the, the direction of uh, our chief of medical officer, but also the nation's chief medical officer. So I hope that answered your question, but there's no guarantee in, in any of the phases. Um, but to, to rephrase your question, I, I, I hope that that means that we'll be into stage three until the vaccine. Thanks, Gabrielle. Do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I'm wondering as well, it, how fluid is the school plan that was announced last week? We've seen some criticisms of the plan circulating on social media. Um, we saw a student survey go out today. Does that mean that the plan could change from what we saw last week? The substantive nature of the plan is based upon the fact that we're in a pandemic uh, and that we have to make accommodations for some of our students, uh, grade 10 to 12, that have more needs uh, during this time. 
Um, but again, as you see, there is a survey out uh, for parents uh, talking about what the effects of COVID has brought to your family. Uh, you know, what are those effects of how you are going to uh, try to move forward? Uh, we're always willing to consider uh, input uh, as we make these decisions. Um, but again, the substantive decisions made as far as how we're going to start the, the classes uh, moving forward, the most important piece was how do we get the most um, uh, exposure to classrooms, to, to, to teachers, uh, with the students learning in mind, uh, most importantly. And, and in that, uh, there has been some, some shuffle, uh, for sure. We, we hope and believe that, uh, that we will do our best to make sure that uh, all students have the, the best opportunities, uh, uh, whether it's in experiential sciences or whether it's in regular scheduled classes. Um, and again, we will, the, the department will continue to engage with teachers and parents and students uh, and to, to check in on, on how our plans work. Um, and again, these are temporary. Uh, we, 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 we are making decisions based upon a pandemic. Uh, the department uh, always on, a, on an ongoing basis makes their decisions with uh, their best uh, interests of their students in mind. And, uh, and we will we'll, we'll get over this situation. And, and I believe that, uh, you know, knowing teachers, uh, as I know very well, uh, they, uh, they do very well in, in situations where, uh, where they have to think outside the box. Um, and uh, I, I know they have the resilience and I know that they will get the support of the department for what they need. Thank you. Next, we'll go to uh, Mario De Sicchio with Radio Canada. Oh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, Premier. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm, of course, very interested by that uh, universal child care and early learning program, but I, I get that uh, more will probably come later. Uh, if you don't have anything else on this, I guess I'll just ask you, like, are there any other programs or just programs that you hope keep from this pandemic uh, when we talk about, you know, when we get into that new normal? Is there any programs that we have in place or that, that were put in place uh, with, with the COVID that, that, you know, you hope that we could keep in Yukon? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, I think as governments, uh, what I've noticed um, – one thing that is going to be better uh, after the, 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 the pandemic, after the vaccine, is uh, individual regions' abilities to communicate with uh, other jurisdictions in the federal government. Uh, we've had uh, so many weekly updates uh, where, I mean, I just got off of a conference call with all of the premiers uh, under the chairing of, uh, of uh, Scott Moe from Saskatchewan, who's chairing the Council of the Federation right now as we negotiate and, and, and uh, communicate with the federal government to make sure that each region's specifics, uh, uniqueness is being taken into consideration. Uh, the, the level of communication, I mean, is, is astounding and uh, that you can't roll that back. I mean, those conduits of communications, uh, they would happen on sometimes, uh, for, for example, for the finance minister's meetings, we would have a finance minister's meeting a year, one, once a year, uh, with some bilateral engagement in between that, uh, we've been having weekly calls. And, uh, and the ability for us to work as a, as a nation, especially when we're seeing what's happening south of the border, uh, I couldn't be prouder of, uh, of, of politicians from every single political party that are putting politics aside and, uh, and moving forward on, on the best interests of Canadians. Before COVID, some of those conversations at the Council of the Federation were starting to really gain some momentum on how we can unify certain regulations, licensings, those types of things. Now that we're into COVID, the conversation has moved to how do we how do we coordinate manufacturing of PPEs? How do we coordinate uh, nurses and doctors, uh, you know, and, and our ability to share in information and knowledge, um, you know, ha having the ability to talk to the nation about um, our endeavors with First Nations governments over traditional knowledge and being able to use that in our decisions, uh, you know, and having that conversation on a weekly basis now as opposed to maybe once uh, a, a, a season, um, that to me is just going to show exponential growth in every single single department. Um, and, um, and maybe it will uh, <laughs> make us less reliant on air travel uh, to meet. You know, in the past, you'd wait and do one air, air travel trip to meet. We can continue to do the air travel trips, but we, we, we could also now meet more regularly right from the comforts of our own ridings uh, and, and still maintain those face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, but at the same time, more engagement means more results, means more for Yukoners. Thanks, Mario. Do you have another uh, follow-up? 
Yeah, I guess on another subject, I guess, uh, could we see, uh, would there be a chance of uh, opening of the border with Alaska uh, without the U.S. or Canada reopening the, the main broader uh, border? Could Is that something even possible or as long as Canada and the U.S. keep uh, renewing their uh, uh, the, the border closures? Is that, you know, is it going to be closed for Alaska as well? Is, that, is there a chance? No, n- not possible. Um, we, we've the decision for opening up of uh, borders to uh, the international communities is a decision that the nation would make. We've had the conversation. I've spoken with Governor Den Levy a few times on, um, you know, smaller openings uh, to bigger openings, uh, whether it be a particular community like Skagway or the the the, the state of Alaska compared to the rest. Um, for for one, the epidemiology in Alaska is not there. Uh, for, for two, it's a decision that's to be made at the national level. So I told D- Governor Dunleavy that I would bring that conversation to the First Minister's conversations. I did uh, right across the nation. Uh, you don't have a lot of jurisdictions in Canada, save maybe one, uh, that is interested in having one-offs. Um, and and really, as we see, like I say, um, uh, some of these states, a lot of these states having to uh, roll back uh, restrictions, um, that conversation, if it had a... Uh, uh, a window, uh, an opening. Uh, I, I, I don't. I don't see it. Thank you. Have I missed any reporters on the line? Okay, great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. The uh, next COVID nineteen update will be on July twenty second, and thank you all for tuning in and listening today. <laughs>